Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today, Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to the best movie news show in the entire galaxy. I am very confident in that statement. Given the panel I am sitting with today, we have all the latest and greatest in the world of cinematic discussion. And Ashley, I know that we all had fun ringing in Dennis's 40th. You know, 40th. I knew that was coming. Uh, yeah, I could have so told you. I, I I, I went to the party a little that early, so I guess I miss, we missed past, because yeah. I guess you we got did. there later. I had a dinner to go to, Dennis. I'm going to make it up to you. Also here, Dennis said. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone who uh, wished me a happy birthday on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, also want to thank all the people who came out to Yay. my thing on Friday. A lot of fun. Yay. I had Christian. I had Mark. Yay. I had Riley. I had Wendy. I had Adam. I had... A Oh, no. oh my no. gosh! Oh. You know, no, I know why. Oh, I know why though. I know I why she was dinner. not. She was at a dinner, and they watched Lawrence of Arabia during the dinner. It was three and a half hour dinner. Also, we are Christian. Wait, wait, wait. wait. And Ashley, I think Sinead wasn't there. Right, the host. Don't Natasha go wasn't there. Yeah. You know, you hear the sound. Oh my yeah. god. That, that's me posting for some new hosts. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, that was, that was you on Slack yeah, looking yeah. for hosts. I just yeah. love how all Hate the hosts all got together and went to dinner somewhere, like an Arby's, right. yeah. you know, somewhere no. fancy. And just decided to sit in the parking lot instead of go to Dennis's 40th birthday which party. Are, which you can oh check my out gosh. my Instagram I'm, feed for right, some I'll, I'll get her, I'm going to get her off the hook. Ashley, out of all the live schmodowns that you've watched, which one is Oh your my gosh, stop it. You know, Christian, that is a great transition. Happy Monday. I'm sure that Happy Ashley Monday. is going to want to finally experience a live in the room schmodown this Friday because guess who's going up against some dude named JTE? This guy, Mark Ellis. Finally, I get off the desk and I come into the ring. I am excellent at movie trivia, and I'm going to prove it this Friday. Christian, do you have any doubts that I'm going to be the one mm, no. winning? No, it's the rematch, and last time you got every question right, we had to put that little monkey on trial, so we'll have to do it again this time, but we're going to throw him in a cage at the end of it. Look forward to a lot of double impact gifs from this guy this week. Make sure you guys check out hashtag Schmodown if you want to talk a lot of smack to JTE on my behalf. I'd really appreciate it. All right, well, we do have a lot of news to get to today, and even before we get to the rundown in the box office, Ashley, we had a new trailer drop this morning. We did. Uh, Paramount has released the final Star Trek Beyond trailer online, showing us more of the story about the Enterprise into their five-year mission when a mysterious force attacks the crew, forcing them to survive on an unknown planet, all set to the music of Rihanna's new song, Sledgehammer. The film opens on July 22nd and stars Idris Elba, Chris Pine, Simon Pegg, Zachary Quinto, Zoe Saldana, John Cho, Anton Yelchin, and Carl Urban. And this trailer was pretty damn good. Dennis and I did a reaction that's going to be up on Collider Video. It might be up already. And Dennis, one of the things that struck me that you pointed out before we even watched the trailer is that, okay, they really had a misstep with the Sabotage trailer. The first time we saw footage from this. Then the, the, re the most recent trailer prior to this, everybody seemed to really be on board with Star Trek Beyond. So then you have this one, and it's a bit of a risk. You have a Rihanna song in there. And I loved it. I thought it was awesome. There's so much action in this. Yes, we got notes of Captain Kirk finally, after three movies, stepping into his own as the captain of the USS Enterprise. But seeing all of the outer space battles, it's something that I haven't seen in a lot of films recently. And it's something I really hope to get a heavy dose of with Star Trek Beyond. What was your take on this trailer? The movie makes me nervous. Uh, because was the trailer, did it have some cool imagery? Yeah, it did. But it, it was really fast. And there was a lot, a lot of explosions. and. And what I'm worried about is Justin Lin's background as a music director. The first trailer was sold on Sabotage. This one was sold as the Rihanna. In the title of the trailer, it's like it, with the new Rihanna song, when they sent out the blast with the new Rihanna song, they're selling the song. Now, did I think that the song actually worked a lot better than Sabotage? Yes, it did. It did. It, it, definitely blended more but I'm I'm worried about the way that they're selling it. it's almost like they're selling the first and the third trailer as music videos Justin Lin's strong point um, and I just don't know yet I, I I still have hopes for it I still want it to be good I I'm one of those people I actually liked the first and the second of the new Star Trek movies so I do have hopes I want to see what Simon Pegg brings to it as writing but the one thing I did notice and I'm curious was that noticeably absent was Elton Yelchin from this uh, from this trailer now they're probably be you know they, I think that they pulled back I think he's in like a maybe a, a shot or two but not in the forefront and because of everything that just just happened maybe they don't want to 
they're trying to be sensitive. They're not capitalizing. So I, I think um, that I noticed that and I kind of understood why. But I just think watching this particular trailer, it just makes me a little nervous going in. I, I wasn't aware it was Rihanna. Like, I, like because I don't know her, you know, as yeah. far as like, I can't hear her voice. Like, oh, that's Rihanna. So it, it just was like somebody singing in a trailer. If they didn't tell me it was, it was Rihanna, I wouldn't have known. So it didn't really bother me. But Dennis, you and I watched this thing together. It seems like you were on board for the most part with what you saw. Yeah, I, don't, I didn't love it like you did, but I did love like, I, I do think uh, I agree with Christian. It's, it's a much better fit than the sabotage one. And, and all the visuals and spectacles that you got to see, the space battles, definitely more of a Star Wars-esque type of yeah. uh, visuals. Mm -hmm. And I think Justin Lane has proven with the, the Fast and the Furious franchise that he can do entertaining action. Let's see if it's maybe a little maybe too over the top in this movie or if he's going to hold back and keep it not realistic but you know what i mean like not not you know cars flying in outer space right. and i'll also say i'm very lucky because i'm not a huge fan of star trek war i do like the reboots mm -hmm. uh, you know i like uh, wrath of khan's a great film but like i'm not so locked into that universe so if somebody else comes on they just want to tell a fascinating story i really liked into darkness so if beyond can be a little bit more that maybe some more substance in this one then i think i'm really going to enjoy the movie okay ashley well we brought up rihanna and speaking Speaking of falling in love in a hopeless place, what is the box office take this weekend? <laughs> it's Monday, which means it's time for the weekend box office report brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Audiences continue to find Dory this weekend with the sequel to Finding Nemo, showing plenty of box office staying power. Finding Dory easily took the number one spot with $73.2 million, declining only 46% and generating the eighth highest second weekend of all time. Dory is already the sixth highest domestic grocer of 2016 after 10 days with 285.6 million, less than 100 million short of the final total of the original. Taking the number two spot was Independence Day Resurgence, pulling in a disappointing 41.6 million. The movie finished about 20% below recent forecasts, which had the sequel matching the 50 million opening weekend from the 1996 original. In the number three spot was Central Intelligence, pulling in 18.4 million for a domestic total of 69.3 million. Blake Lively's Shark Tale The Shallows took the number four spot, performing above forecast with $16.7 million. And at number five, Matthew McConaughey's historical drama Free State of Jones with $7.8 million. Mark, thoughts on the less than seller box office for Independence Day resurgence? It's very warranted, Ashley, because that movie is absolute garbage. It is <laughs> one of the worst things that I've experienced in a movie theater recently. We all were excited to see it Thursday night. Despite what we heard from the critics, I love the first Independence Day. I just wanted to go have a fun, stupid time at the theater. And I hated watching the movie. I hated my experience in there. I was very, very, very let down. And it leads me to believe that one of the other stories we're going to be talking about in this show is going to be an even worse movie than what Independence Day Resurgence was, if that's possible. But I'm happy for Finding Dory. I think that by the time Friday rolled around, the writing was on the wall that Finding Dory is one of those movies that's here to stay. It's not just a cash grab sequel to a great Pixar film. It, in and of itself, is a very, very good attempt at making this thing a franchise. And I think that kids, families, everybody flocked to this movie again, and deservedly so. I really like that movie. It's nice to see Central Intelligence hold up a little bit. The Shallows, I thought, had the opening that they would expect. You know, it's a shark movie. You got Blake Lively in there. There's definitely some sort of appeal going in there. I was excited to see The Shallows, too. So people were interested. It's a summertime movie. Is it Jaws? No, but it made a little bit of cash, and that's fine. Free State of Jones, I didn't think would do that well, but it barely got into the top five. It's like point, point, point five or something over the conjuring two which almost knocked it out so it's not really marketed as a summer movie it's not supposed to be it didn't really fit in with the rest of the box office fair so i understand why the take wasn't that good and critics didn't really care for it all that much so dennis we have finding dory dominating independence day resurgence did you think this was fair yeah, I mean, with Independence Day, it wasn't as big a surprise. We saw that they weren't screening it for the press or any of the media. It wasn't tracking very well. And and we just had heard, so, and Finding Dory, is, it's just a powerhouse. It's a sequel to one of the more beloved Pixar movies. And, you know, Disney's probably paying off people to bash Secret Life of Pets so that, that <laughs> they can get more money on Finding Dory. Uh, but also, you know, if, if Conjuring 2 had made uh, a little bit more, I would have gotten my five out of five. But I think it was either you or Roca that had gotten that the, the box office predictions on Friday. I wasn't on Friday, okay, but I Friday. did talk about. Uh, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if Roca got it again. The guy's is the new Oracle. Or you, or you were on with. I was with, on, yeah, and uh, I, you know, Dennis, when I make the predictions, they go in yeah. one ear and out the other. Okay. Yeah, I did. But this is, I think, predictable. 
I, this is the one. This is the one time that I look at these numbers and I go, yeah, I think that if all of us were on the panel and said, yeah, these are kind of the numbers that we're looking at, it, you'd probably come to this this breakdown if the whole crew did it because you look at Dory, the way that it fell off was it was just about fifty percent. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I would. Uh, that's what I guessed on when we were talking about with Schnapp and Clark last week. Independence Day is just crap. I mean, that's that's the thing, and yep. not screening it. And one of the things someone tweeted me this morning, like, "Well, why would you say that? Didn't you just want it to be a fun, dumb popcorn movie?" Yes, I want it to be a fun, dumb popcorn movie. And to me, in my opinion, it was none of that. It was just a sloppy mess, and it looks like a bunch of people felt the same way. Maybe you didn't, but um, in our opinion, I, I mean, we, we don't go into these like Transformers. Like, yes, I want it to be just dumb and right. fun, and it's not. It I'm just, sorry. It, to me, it was just a bad movie all the way around. Not a not a good bad movie, just a bad movie. But Central Intelligence is the one I think that out of all of them stands most because what did it make last last Central week? Central Intelligence I mean, had a forty eight percent right? drop that's great this week. For that so movie. for a comedy, that's really that's nice. Great. The fact that it defeated The Shallows yeah, for third man, place, almost, I thought was impressive. That movie almost made twenty million on its second week and the reviews were, were okay but it, it just shows this is back to that conversation that we keep having on this show the rock is a guy who makes money and so you understand why he's in the stories every day with a brand new movie because his movies are making money this the fact that, that movie made almost 20 million in the second week with independence day and the shallows coming out that's a big that's a big feat the shallows i think just around between the 16 20 million that that's okay for that movie and the reviews even though i didn't necessarily love that movie reviews were pretty good on it it was the high the out of the new releases had the best reviews on Rotten Tomatoes, sure. And Free State of Jones, I think was a bad movie as well, but I also think it is, I agree with you, it was just the wrong place to put this movie with the movie, the big releases that were coming out. Plus, it, it felt like if you're going to get, that movie should have come out in September. Because yeah, that movie makes no reason, million, no reason no, why it's it in, in the, the middle of summer. Yeah, yeah. I, I would have made the argument that it's nice counter-programming to all the summer fair, but like, look, I, I was in the minority because I, I did enjoy the movie a lot and a lot of people hated the movie. Some people just thought it wasn't good movie making, even though the history was very interesting. So I totally understand that argument. Let me ask you guys something, though, because Finding Dory, you knew it was going to be be huge opening weekend. It's a sequel. It's a Pixar movie. But this hold that's a less than 50% drop, doesn't that indicate that Finding Dory stands on its own legs or tail, as the case may be? Yeah, I mean, a lot of these animated films have that. They, yeah. they have repeat viewings from kids and, and their families and, and good word of mouth, too. I mean, yeah. the thing is, it is positively reviewed and, and that's going to travel amongst people who may or be on the fence of seeing it. Or not. Does Secret um, Life of Pets get anywhere close to this thing? Um, not... It's a pretty good. It's a pretty good marketing. I think it's. Gonna, I else. think it's going to do well. I don't think it does as well as Dory. But I did see someone in the comments mention how come you didn't give credit to Kevin Hart? Well, Ride Along Two didn't do a lot. Of, didn't do great box office. Uh, the Wedding Ringer didn't do great box office. So right now, I am giving the credit to The Rock because I believe that if you would have put someone else in there right now with Kevin Hart, I don't think it makes that kind of money on on week yeah, one. Even week two. when he paired up with Will Ferrell, it didn't do that. No, well. uh, Get Hard didn't yeah. do that well. So his movies with with other people who have had names have not performed so and and right along too was a sequel so it i'm giving the credit to the rock on this one i, I like kevin hart a little bit i'm not oh, saying okay. that i just like him that's not <laughs> it I, I, I kevin hart's fine but i'm just on as far as box office draw he's not the one that's bringing in the money right now it's it, his chemistry with the rock was off the charts and it was great and he added a lot to the film but the box office, I'm giving the credit to The Rock. So you're saying, like, I'm like The Rock and JT is like Kevin Hart. Okay, <laughs> yeah. that sounds yeah, fair yeah, to yeah, me. Yeah. All right, Ash, what's our next story? Though Ant-Man went through a major upheaval before principal production began when original director Edgar Wright exited due to creative differences, the movie was shepherded to the finish line by Peyton Reed, enjoying a positive response in the process, a successful box office, and a recent Saturn Award for Best Comic Adaptation. The second movie was given the green light with the same creative team back for Ant-Man and the Wasp, which is currently slated for a 2018 release date following Avengers Infinity Wars Part 1. Speaking with Modern Myth Media at the recent Saturn Award, Reed confirmed that the film will, will deal directly with the aftermath of Captain America's Civil War. He also went on to talk about how Evangeline Lilly's Wasp will figure into the new narrative, saying... 
It's something we're excited about. For me as a comic nerd, I always thought of Ant-Man and Wasp as a team, and that's a lot of what the second movie is really about, is how they work together, what their personal and professional relationships are like. To show her finally fully formed in this movie is really exciting. We really get to introduce this character into that universe. I mean, we've introduced the character, but we haven't seen her with her full power set and everything, so to me, she's not a supporting character in this movie. It's every bit as much her movie as it is Scotland. Ant-Man and the Wasp is scheduled for release on July 6, 2018. Christian, what do you think about Reed's comments about the Wasp and Ant-Man and the Wasp? I love it. And I and I was I was lucky enough, and I, I mentioned this, we've been watching since the AMC days. I got to visit the set of Ant-Man and listen to Peyton Reed when when a lot of the we went through the Edgar Wright to possibly Adam McKay and then the Peyton Reed to where people were doing the Guardians of the Galaxy. Who? Because they, it was like, why is Peyton Reed directing this thing? And I remember being there and him coming out and talking to us and being and saying he was an Ant-Man fan. I was like, yeah, right, sure you were. And then you hear him breaking down everything that he liked about the series and why he liked it. And then seeing the movie, I really enjoyed the first Ant-Man. You, he's got a good grasp on exactly what he wants from these characters and how to tell the story on how to blend the comedy of Paul Rudd and, and not, not go over the top with it. And so he, the movie's called Ant-Man and the Wasp. It's going to be about Ant-Man and the Wasp. And I think that it's, it's part of the Marvel storytelling device to continue to tell brand new stories with this. And you're going to change this up a bit. And I like the fact that it's going to, it's going to incorporate the aftermath of Civil War. And I buy everything that Kate, Peyton Reed is saying right now, just because he is, um, he, he he's just he's locked in. Yeah. By the time Ant Man was actually released in theaters, I had full confidence it was going to be yet another awesome Marvel movie. Simply because it, it, you know when you lose a director and you add on somebody else, there's always going to be turmoil. There's always going to be nerves. But the way that Marvel handled that so uh, deftly was like, oh, okay, they really believe in this movie. So I wasn't surprised it was good. What did surprise me is how much I liked Evangeline Lilly's character in that movie. She was one of my favorite favorite parts of the film so seeing that they are going to be you know even in this film for the lack of a better word it's going to be you're going to have a leading male hero and a leading female hero I love hearing this the only disappointing thing about this news story is that July 6 2018 is like over two years away so we got some time and don't worry you got plenty of days to cook up that story a little bit more but yeah this sounds like good news to me yeah if they're going to call it Ant-Man and the Wasp they can't regulate her to a side character right. or a supporting character she has to be the co-lead and you know we got a tease scene that the uniform in the post credit scene of Ant-Man we want to see what happens I mean Evangeline Lilly is a, uh, an actress that I like since the Lost days and she did really well in the Hobbit series even though those you know that kind of trilogy was you know had mixed reaction uh, and, and from the trailers I remember seeing for Ant-Man I was like I don't know if she fit in with this, but then after seeing the movie, I was like, okay, she's got good chemistry. And so I, I'm excited for this one. And this, uh, I also liked hearing that it's going to be playing, you know, at, on the heels of what Civil War brought yeah. us because Ant Man was a nice, they peppered in Ant Man during Civil War. And it was nice to see the comedic moments, but also there is going to be some fallout from Civil War. So the fact that that will influence the story, I think, is a bonus. Yeah. Okay, good. Agreed. Thanks for agreeing with me, Table. <laughs> uh -huh. Next story. Though Independence Day Resurgence underperformed at the box office this weekend, director Roland Emmerich isn't slowing down. Thanks to a report from Entertainment Weekly, the director will next hell Moonfall, a film based on a spec script recently acquired by Universal Pictures. Written by Emmerich, Harold Closter, and Spencer Cohen, the story is described as a collision between 2012 and Close Encounters of the Third Kind that tells the story of an unlikely band of misfits, misfits who must unite to save humanity when the moon falls out of orbit and comes crashing down on Earth. Emmerich and Closer have worked together on several films before, including White House Down, The Day After Tomorrow, and 10,000 BC. A release date has yet to be set. Dennis, what do you think about Emmerich's next project, Moonfall? Well, the premise reminds me of kind of a more obscure cartoon, Thunder the Barbarian, where the, the moon did crash into the Earth and there was this whole post-apocalyptic world. But anyways, besides that... Um, <laughs> What I think about it is we talked about the Stargate uh, sequel reboot or whatever the hell thing uh, last week. And, and we, I think we all kind of bought it, but we kind of had reservations like, what is Independence Day Resurrection going to be like? And uh, that's how we're going to feel. Well, we saw it and now we know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not looking forward to it because had Resurrection been fun and entertaining, even though this premise sounds stupid, 
I would have been all for it because I've been like, oh, Independence Day was so much fun. He's going to take this silly concept and we're just going to have even more silly popcorn fun. But now that we saw what he did, I'm, yeah, I'm less than thrilled. For you know, maybe I'm just the, the super positive yeah. guy because I, I buy a lot of these things. Maybe I'm just made of money. And so when I read a story like this, I want to put a positive spin on it, but I just can't after seeing Independence Day Resurgence. I sell this so hardcore. Are you bringing back Ben Affleck and Bruce Willis and Liv Tyler? Is Aerosmith going to write a hit song about this movie? It's It sounds like Armageddon again. It's like, Instead of an asteroid, it's the moon. Yeah, that's right. One of the worst things that ever happened to Star Wars canon or the Star Wars Extended Universe was when a Wookiee got hit by a moon, Christian. I know we all remember that day, and it's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard in my life. That, that Yeah, maybe the moon can fall out of orbit, maybe in the hands of a more capable, big-budget director, this could be something intriguing, but I would sell this premise regardless. This sounds like a bad take on a Bond movie in the 70s, and with Roland Emmerich doing it, I just have no faith in the guy to be able to pull something like this off. I hope I changed my tune, because when I just read it, it's like, it could be dumb popcorn fun, but that's what the Independence Day was supposed to be, and it simply wasn't. It missed the mark on all levels. So I can't imagine that Moonfall was going to be that good. You told me that Nolan or Fincher or Brian Singer or Matthew Vaughn was doing this movie. I'd be like, oh, that could be interesting. I mean, I don't know about the, mo the name of the, t the a t Moonfall. It's like, that's, that's, that you see Roland Emmerich going, that's genius. Moonfall. <laughs> it's like, my next movie will be. Shy, tying shoes. It's like he just comes up with these silly titles of all his movies. But like the, for, for me, it's because of Roland Emmerich that I'm going to say no thank you at all because the resume that she just read off about uh, who, about the things that she, he had co-written with this guy, mm -hmm. White House Down, which no is thanks. like the Citizen Kane out of the three of these movies, uh, the uh, what is Day After Tomorrow, and then 10,000 BC, until 10 minutes ago, I'd forgotten about that movie even existed. <laughs> I got ill hearing the other side. This is going to be horrible. But imagine Every, how different we would have felt if we had come out of Resurrection going, oh my God, that was so we much felt fun. So, we would have felt like, so yeah. much different because we would be like, okay, wait a minute. He's back to what he was doing with the first Independence Day. Because even revisiting the first Independence Day, you were invested in the yeah. characters up until, because even though there's some far, there's a lot of far-fetched ideas yes. in that movie, but you had fun with it because you cared about it. Like the, Even the music was done well. Nothing was done well in this last movie. It, it just wasn't. And I think that this movie is going to be like Marx. It's going to be even a worse. Uh, it's going to be, and I like Armageddon, so I don't want to say that, but it's going to be a really watered down, silly version, more silly than Armageddon. It's, it, it really is. And, I'm, and, I, and I can't believe, and I said this in our review, that he makes Michael Bay look like Kubrick. He, it's at this point, the movies, his resume, Michael Bay's resume is a hundred times better than this guy because at least I know that even with, even with Transformers, the last Transformers, and I know I had people yell at me and say it when I said it in the office the other day, I, did, I hated the last Transformers movie. It is 100 times better than Independence Day 2 because Ooh, I still, I still, right I there. still cared. I still, even though, because it was Wahlberg and there was something about him that even though it was in, and the movie's idiotic by no means. If I, if I it was like a, I had to fight for this movie to the death. I'd still take that over anything that this guy's doing right now. That's an argument you don't want to have. No. Regardless. But really like, we could have walked out of Independence Day Resurgence and been like, oh, yeah, Moonfall sounds good. This new Stargate reboot that he wants to do, that sounds awesome, too. But right. just I don't trust any project. And again, you read this, and it sounds like something that the Sci-Fi Channel would create yep. to follow up Sharknado 7. So I'm sorry. We just, we're not even a buy or sell yet, but I'm selling the crap out of Moonfall. <laughs> You're a bad movie. It's also the it's comments like, that he's been making too. I mean, he was taking shots at Marvel movies and taking uh, comic Can you say movies. something like comic book movies like are we're copying him or something? Well, he said like no. That. He said they're like they're silly or stupid. And it's like really, <laughs> yeah. you're the guy that's gonna say that. I mean, because it's no, don't don't just start crapping on other movies that are successful right now because you're trying to sell your movie. That's that's a that's a fast way to get fans to turn against you. Whether you're talking about, it, you shouldn't just crap on things that people love, whether or not it's DC mm -hmm. or it's Marvel or it's Star Wars. Just sell your movie for what it is don't start taking cracks at it because you're gonna unless you are like the best filmmaker of all time which he is not he should keep <laughs> it zipped Ashley, the moon is falling. Please rescue us. All right. A report surfaced a year ago that Warner Brothers had commissioned a new script for a live-action Akira adaptation from the second-season showrunner of Daredevil, Marco J. Ramirez, with another rumor later saying Christopher Nolan was also involved in the project, helping plan it for a possible trilogy. From the latest episode of Meet the Movie Press, film reporter Jeff Snyder revealed Warner Brothers is now actively courting Justin Lin to sign on to direct Akira. Akira tells the story of a metropolis built on the ashes of
of Tokyo, annihilated by an apocalyptic blast of unknown origin that triggered World War III. The lives of two streetwise teenage friends, Tetsuo and Kaneda, change forever when dormant paranormal abilities begin to awaken in Tetsuo, who becomes a target for a shadowy government agency. The studio has yet to officially confirm Justin Lin's involvement at this time. Mark, thoughts on an Akira movie with Justin Lin directing? Ashley, give me your number and I'll call you on July 22nd with my answer because okay, I okay. need to see Star Trek Beyond before I can give an official answer. Like we just talked about how Independence Day Resurgence really influenced our, our thoughts on the director's ability to do a new project. I think that's going to be the case with Star Trek Beyond as well because the storyline of Akira sounds awesome. It sounds like a great intricate plot details and exciting things that you can make a trilogy out of, but I'm just not sure yet Justin Lin is going to be the right guy. I have a lot of confidence in him. I have a lot of hope for what he can do with a property like Star Trek or Akira. I just need to see Star Trek Beyond before I can confidently say, yeah, give this guy the keys to what could be an awesome trilogy. Dennis? Yeah, I'm interested. Akira is one of my favorite animations of all time. And there's been a lot of talks about this movie, a live action version of it. it I think at one time they were rumored like they wanted Zac, Zac Efron in the Canada role. Wasn't DiCaprio attached at one yeah, point? Yeah, I think so. There's been a lot of things. And, and it's going to be interesting to see how they adapt it. Are they going to make it, you know, they were talking about making it New Manhattan instead of New Tokyo. But, I mean, it's, it's kind of tough. The name of the movie is called Akira. It's a, Yeah, I, I think it's a tough one to do. I mean, if they, they cast it and make it based here in the U.S., I don't know. I, I as a fan of the original, it's really tough for me to see something that different. Christian, I'm gonna buy it, but same with the same hesitations that you have. I want to see what happens with the uh, the new Star Trek movie because we know that Justin did very well with the uh, Fast and Furious franchise, and now to move into Star Trek with a little with not just the action, with a little more depth in the characters. I want to see how he does there because that's all Fast and Furious really called for. You know, we didn't need the the in depth character analysis. All we needed was a lot of fun, and he does that well. And I think he can do that well in Kira. But I think that because of hardcore fans, you want to see it done right, and you want a director who's going to do it right. So I'm not going to sell him on the fact that I didn't like necessarily love this last Star Trek trailer. I don't think that's fair. So I want to see the movie, and I think that he can pull off a lot of stuff that this franchise is going to call for so i'll buy it for now but the same thing waiting until i see star trek dennis because you're so steeped in the war of akira does it need the big time you know blockbuster movie treatment uh, do you think it deserves that or do you think that audiences will respond to it if done right yeah i mean the thing is this is where the conundrum happens all the time it in order to do akira correctly you need a pretty big budget because mm -hmm. the 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 setting the landscapes the visual effects it's not like just shooting it you know in modern time so and then once you throw that that amount of money into it then all the other things come with it where you have to then think about what kind of stars you're going to bring into it and, and and stuff like that and then maybe beef it up it, it's like the you know like with star trek right the, the television series was never really action focused. It was mostly story and character driven. But when you, you, you adapt it for a movie, you want to get butts in the seat. So obviously you have more space battles, more gun battles, more hand to hand combat, all that stuff. So who knows what, what they're going to do with it. Well, the good news if you're an Akira fan is that they are talking about a movie once again and the director that might be attached is not named Roland Emmerich. All right, let's move over to Wendy, who's been monitoring the chat room since we started these stories. So, Wendy, going all the way back to the Star Trek Beyond most recent trailer and through our other main topics, what are they saying in the chat room right now? Well, for the Star Trek Beyond final trailer, the majority of the chat didn't like the Rihanna song, and they also really didn't care too much about the trailer. Redlock Life says, perhaps I'm in the minority here, but I felt the Rihanna song or singing was more out of place than the first trailer with Sabotage. And for the Ant-Man and Wasp story, the chat's liking Reed's comment and they're very interested in a sequel. Or a, or a says, love Reed's comment. It's not necessary for a comic nerd to direct a superhero movie, but you gotta love it when someone who is passionate about the source material is behind the wheel of these movies. For Moonfall with Roland Emmerich, though the chat's not too excited about Moonfall and they're even, even less excited to see uh, Emmerich attached to this. X G2 says, that sounds like they're ripping off Guardians and Suicide Squad. And finally, for the Akira movie, 
It looks like the chat is excited to see Akira, but they are worried about Hollywood not giving us a proper adaptation. Fat Petite says, please, please, please don't whitewash. Akira Neo Tokyo is essential to the story, as are Kaneda and Tetsuo being Japanese. All right, that's what's going on with the chat room. We will check back in with Wendy at the end of Buy or Sell, which is the segment we now find ourselves in. This is where Ashley's going to give us a topic. We will say whether we buy it or sell it using our real hard-earned cash. What do you got for us, Wendy? Wendy. Ashley. Well, Wendy, you want to take the story? All right. <laughs> this weekend saw the release of... Uh, oh, come on. <laughs> All right. This weekend saw the release of Nicholas Winding Refn's The Neon Demon in a limited capacity. Next up is a French miniseries about an elite police squad of... But beyond that, only rumors have pointed out what the Danish filmmaker's next feature will be. However, just this week, he expressed interest in a bigger property that happens to be under the DC Comics banner. According to a report from Business Insider, Refn said he'd love to direct a big-budget studio movie and is especially interested in the story of Barbara Gordon known as Batgirl. Here's what he said about the comic adaptation. God, I would love to make one. It would probably be great fun. I just don't know when it's going to happen. I very much enjoy my freedom creatively, but I also would love to make one of those big Hollywood films that costs a lot of money and has a lot of people running around with cell phones and all that insanity. What ones are left? You know the one I want to do? I want to make Batgirl. Let's get Warner working on it. Though Ruffin has mentioned his desire to direct a female-led superhero property before, the director once said he wanted to helm a Wonder Woman movie, no deal has been made. Christian, a buy or sell a Batgirl movie directed by Nicholas Winding Refn. I'm going to sell it because I just don't think it's ever going to happen. I just think, be, and it was, it was something key to what he said, and that was the creativity. He's like an indie king. He is like the indie darling. Like if there are fans, I'm not necessarily a huge fan of his movies, but he has very loyal, dedicated fans. It is becoming an event when this guy puts out a movie. People love to go see his films, and that. And then with that logic, well, why, then why wouldn't you want to see him do a big studio film? Because I don't know if he can let up that kind of control. I even think that some, and especially for what DC is doing right now, and the way DC is trying to form this narrative, it would be a risk to have someone like Refn do it because Refn's going to make his own movie, very similar to me of what happened when they let Shane Black do Iron Man three. It became a Shane Black movie, and I happen to like Iron Man three as a standalone Shane Black movie, but as a Marvel movie, it doesn't work. It just as a Marvel Cinematic Universe movie, Iron Man three to me doesn't work, and that's what happens when you bring on a guy that likes to do things his way, and that's Shane Black who can conform to the big budget. And I could be completely wrong, and you bring in Refn, and then Refn just, set, like he says, wants to try it out, follows, follows the studio rules, if you will, and makes uh, the best Batgirl movie that we've ever seen. I just think a guy like this is in, is in his arena right now for what he's doing, and I think TV, which is what he's doing next, is a perfect uh, venue for him to continue having his creative opinion heard. Yeah, I, I have to sell it, even though I am a little intrigued by his comments. When I first read them, I was like, oh, he's joking. But then you do a little bit of research, you're like, no, he actually does care about this property, and he really did have a pitch for Wonder Woman that he wanted to help out with as well. So maybe he does care about the, the DC Universe. Maybe he's interested in telling these stories, and Batgirl, he feels, is the right one for him. You know, lost in all this is something that Christian brought up is when he says that the next project he's doing is that is that mini series about a you know French detectives and it sounds like if he pulls that off maybe we do want to see him do Batgirl. But Neon Demon is a movie that he did and we didn't mention the box office report mainly because it opened on less than a thousand screens and it only averaged seven hundred and seventy five dollars per showing which is not a great number at all. So I I I, I wouldn't hate seeing it. I'm not the biggest fan of him in the world, but I do appreciate his artistic eye. I just don't think we're ever going to see him direct a Batgirl in this current DC universe anyway. How do you feel, Dennis? Well, I, I buy in the sense that I would love to see it. Never going to happen, though. I mean, with what Christian is saying, his I don't think he can conform to a studio format. His, his style is so of, you know, <clears throat> to himself. And I can't see them allowing him to do, you know, <clears throat> his movies are visually beautiful, but I mean, he has a lot of shots, slow tracking shots down hallways of character, you know what I mean? Like, I can't imagine that with Batgirl, and, and he does very violent films too. Batgirl's not gonna be rated R, I mean, unless he, you know, he does a take on the killing joke, but even still, 
I just don't see where there's a fit, even though I personally would be very intrigued to see it. Do you guys think we're going to see a bad girl movie in, in this current setup universe? Not for a while. Not for a while, unless they unless unless she's introduced in um, in one of Affleck's movies to because that that's how they did it with Iron Man two is that they eventually they they introduced you to Black Widow and then she became a beloved character and now Kevin Feige now this is like almost what ten years later or whatever it might be or eight years later that we're talking about possibly getting a Black Widow movie so I think we're a while away before we get a Batgirl film. All right, who's the actress that plays Arya Stark? Get ready. Just say. Yeah. Just get ready. Get just start wearing bat suits for practice. Just be prepared Maisie if Williams. you get Maisie the phone Williams. Call. Yeah. Maisie Williams. Yeah. yeah. Get ready, Maisie. Okay. Shira, what's our next story? A new big screen version of Masters of the Universe has been in the works for years with various writers penning new drafts, but no version has gone anywhere near a green light in front of the camera. The latest attempt is over at Sony Pictures with Charlie's Angels director Mick G and talks to bring He Man to the big screen. And now it sounds like the filmmaker is meeting with potential stars for the movie. Kellen Lutz, who found fame with a supporting role in the Twilight Saga, following it up with The Legend of Hercules, recently revealed that he met with Mick G specifically about the Masters of the Universe movie. Lutz posted to Twitter telling Masters of the Universe fans that he had an amazing meeting with Mick G and his Wonderland production president, My Mary Viola, and that the project is in good hands. No official word has been given on the casting, so this could be a simple meeting to start. Dennis Byersall, Kellen Lutz as He-Man in Masters of the Universe. Well, I buy the Photoshop job that uh, Ray did. <laughs> I'm like laughing at that thing. I like uh, the blonde locks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I sell Kellen Lutz as He-Man. I mean, I haven't really seen him in too much. He was in Twilight. Uh, he had a Hercules. I didn't even see that. Good for that, you. You're yeah. lucky. Uh, he was briefly in Generation Kill. I haven't seen anything from him that, to me, gives off a He-Man vibe. I mean, maybe he physically could do it, but I just don't get that sense from him. So, I, and I don't, and he hasn't been proven to be uh, someone that can bring in people into the box office either. And if they're gonna actually spend a lot of money on this I, I just don't see him as the right guy well we kick off with a sell from dennis um christian it looked like this news hit you in a way that your body didn't respond in a favorable fashion oh cringer uh, here, down here here's the problem with this and this is what i said if, if you're uh, you know my history with masters of the universe this movie should be Lord of the Rings meets Star Wars. That is the movie. That is the trilogy that you can do. The 2002 series, what they did with Masters of the Universe is the way you tell this story. I always thought Chris Hemsworth would have been a perfect He-Man. Um, now, whether or not they're going to do the transformation of Adam into He-Man, we don't know. Or if they're going to take it the way that they did <coughs> with Dolph Lundgren back in the day, I don't know. I And I'm not necessarily... I, the reason I'm going to sell Kellen Lutz is because I have to sell McG. McG is not the guy to do this movie. He absolutely is not the guy. He can do certain things, but he doesn't even. From what I heard, I've heard from somebody inside that he's pretty much. Yeah, they offered it to me, so I'm, you know, it's a check. I'm going to do it. And that, that's not a guy you want doing Masters of the Universe. That is not a guy. He is. He knows nothing about the property. He knows nothing about what it should be. It's going to have some cheesy jokes. It's going to have this light tone that it shouldn't have. It's Lord of the Rings meets Star Wars. It's science meets dark magic. There's so much to explore in Eternia. There's so much. And Kellen Lutz as the guy? No, he's not. He's not. He's not the guy that is going to, it's going to be a one-off and it's going to be a joke and it's going to crush Masters of the Universe. I hope that I'm wrong. But if this is the direction that they're going into, everything that I'm hearing so far, uh, Masters of the Universe could have been something really special and it's, and it's, it feels like it's going to be uh, a, a a, a crap box. For That's more the on That's Christian's the involvement with Masters of the Universe, yeah. make sure you guys check out his podcast. He just did one with Mark <laughs> Riley. They talked a lot about their backstory in this world, and it's pretty fascinating stuff. If you want more on He-Man, you can just come visit my closet back home in Virginia <laughs> because I loved this when I was a kid. I was a He-Man guy first. Everything else was, was second. Even my Star Wars tours and my G.I. Joes, they only came into the game when He-Man allowed it. Having said that, I never saw the Masters of the Universe in, in 87 with Dolph Lundgren and Frank Langella. Still seen it? This guy, I've still oh, wow. never seen it, and I hear I don't need to. Nah. But <clears throat> just knowing everything I know from the animated show and that movie coming out, 
it just I, I still have a hard time seeing how you could pull off the vision that you have for this where it's Star Wars meets Lord of the Rings and it's this great thing because it's just hard to Masters of the Universe is one thing the guy's name is He-Man it's a dated name it sounds it, it, it sounds awful I know, She-Ra but is a weird dated name there's a lot of stuff in there that you can pull from that lore and make it something cool I just don't understand how you make this super like like dark and serious and have a little bit of fun with it I don't understand. It's such a narrow window to hit. That's in. why I'm telling you to see the 2002 series because they use that. It's almost like the He-Man was someone through throughout thousands of years that held the moniker, the person with the sword. There was one that followed Adam beforehand when the sword was found. They went into the legacy of what it was. It's fascinating. Go. It was a limited series that uh, in t 2002, 2003. It is a great series, and it showed exactly the tone that I'm talking about here for what it, you can absolutely take those things. When we pitched this thing originally when I was at Silver, people were so hesitant. Oh, it's got a purple tiger. It's got a tiger and a guy with weird pants and a, and a Dutch boy haircut. It's not going to work. And then you start to kind of go into it, and that's how we were able to kind of sell it because Justin Marks, who just wrote Jungle Book, wrote a great treatment also that was going to explore those dark those dark tones but still have some more fun with it and that's the one that started to get pushed forward and then things fell apart as happens sometimes but now this just sounds like they're going to go back into this like, there was a script going around that john woo had done that had he-man eating cheeseburgers and taught and saying <laughs> like ridiculous transformers like stuff cheeseburgers and in slow motion whatever is going to happen i feel like that's where <laughs> we're going to go again but just think I mean, you could have all the the technology that they had even in the in the silly 80s cartoon they had futuristic stuff. Like there was some cool stuff that you could put in that fantasy world, and it's just it's something that we haven't seen in a bit. Imagine like a Lord of the Rings with a Star Wars world, and that's your that's your movie. Is Orko in the uh, the animated? Series you can do about? it. You could do it in oh in the yeah I believe he's in the I, I want an Orko. He's in the 2002 one. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting an Orko. Yeah. If I'm yeah. getting a movie, I want to get an Orko. Yeah, Skeletor's and Skeletor's backstory in the 2002 is more flushed out of who he was. Um, it's it's got a lot of lore, a lot of great lore. Do you, do you guys think that something like Warcraft's domestic non-success is going to hurt this this movie. I mean, look, it's a fantasy property that didn't do well in America at all, but it it, it has name brand value and it still did not do well in the United States. So it, it's it's a it's a logical thing to bring up, especially when you have a guy. I'm going to sell Kellen once as He-Man. By the way, I yeah. think he actually is going to end up playing him, but I sell it as something I want to see, even though physically he does resemble the character a lot. Because look, if you are going to do a property like a Warcraft or a He-Man and you want to sell it domestically, maybe it can make a lot of money overseas, but you need to have a big star. You need to have somebody who has acting chops, somebody that people are going to line up to see, regardless of what Kellen Lutz's resume is so far. Nobody's lining up around a block to see that guy be in a movie. Same could be said for Chris Hemsworth outside of the Marvel Universe, though. Yeah, maybe, but if you look, we can go on for this topic for long. I could have a, I could talk about this for an hour of the way that I'm really convinced of how this property could work. I've done it before. It's been in many meetings of why this thing could work and should work, and it's just it has to be done in the right way. And I think because people are worried about, well, there's a battle cat and there's an orco. It's got to be silly and fun. No, it doesn't. You can have fun with it, but you don't have to go completely McG with it. I'm not the guy <laughs> crapping on your idea, man. I okay, I love He Man, I Battle Cat, Man at Arms. I salute you. All right, what's our next story, Ash? 20th Century Fox has released the first full Morgan trailer online. The movie is the debut film from Luke Scott, son of Ridley Scott, and stars Kate Mara as a corporate troubleshooter sent to evaluate a terrifying incident at a remote top secret lab where she discovers scientists have created a new form of evil inhabiting a human form. Morgan is played by the witch star Anya Taylor-Joy alongside Rose Leslie, Boyd Holbrook, Michelle Yeoh, Jennifer Jason Lee, and Paul Giamatti. It opens in theaters on September 2nd. Mark Byers saw the full trailer for Morgan. Buy it, Ash. I am two feet deep into this movie. I really enjoyed this trailer because it had that creepy vibe to it. It felt a little Twilight Zone. It felt a little ex machina at the beginning. And when you have talent involved, the, or promising talent, which is what, Luke, by all accounts, Luke Scott is. Yes, he comes from a great family of filmmaking, but I like the way that this trailer took me on a little story of its own. It looks like my kind of scary movie. So so I'm definitely into Morgan. Christian, you're not the biggest horror suspense kind of guy. What do you think of this trailer? Um, first of all, I take issue with that because I am when it's done well. And this movie looks like it's going to be done well. I buy it. Oh, good. I don't. I, sometimes I, it's the paint by numbers that I don't like. But good movies with with pretty good plot and some interesting characters and great actors always intrigues me. And this does all of that. So it's a big buy for me. I'm very curious what Tony, uh, what um, Ridley Scott's son is going to do here. And 
to I mean, just looking at it reminded me a little bit of species but a little bit better version okay. of species yeah. um, I, I like species but i like i liked what what was happening i like the i like that actress from from the witch i want to see more of her right. the there's yeah and it's it was like it was like um species meets remember the movie daryl remember daryl back in the day no one oh, remembers Daryl. Yeah, it was like it, the it was like D. It was D. Like, yeah, dot, yeah, 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 it was like a program, but it, yeah. it's yeah. This is uh, this Daryl. is it was very interesting to me, and I like that I didn't. I got enough out of it. Don't show me any more. I got enough out that I know exactly kind of where the story needs to go and is probably going to go. But I'm on board. Um, so Dennis, you see this trailer, and Kate Mara. It's almost nice to see her just get the Fantastic yeah. Four off, and then she's in a new movie. What do you think about this trailer? Yeah, I liked it as well. I'll buy it. I mean, I wasn't over the moon for it. I wasn't like, oh my god, I have to see this. Uh, I, I like you, not into horror, but this has a sci-fi bend to yeah. it, so that will get me more into it. I also really liked uh, what's her name, Anya Taylor Joy in The Witch, because I, I I thought that was a horror movie that I I quite enjoyed. She's kind of almost unrecognizable in, yeah. in this compared to to the witch, and it, it's also got a great cast with Paul Giamatti, Jen, Jennifer Jason Lee, um, and we we, we want to see you know with Ridley Scott's son like to see if the the talent you know has 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 been passed on. And it comes out September second. This thing could be a little sleeper because you you come out you come off the heels of summer, the stupid mechanic movie that I think is going to be great. Opens the weekend before that. So then we we're, we get a different vibe going into the fall with the release of Morgan on September second. This is a perfect time for this movie to come mm -hmm. out. And going what we were saying before with Free State of Jones, this is a movie that knows where to put itself because it's not going to be in the conversations for Oscar movies, but it's not a summer big blockbuster movie. It's probably got a smaller budget. It can make it's it's going to be during that time where people are well what's out there right now and the horror fans or maybe the sci-fi fans will come out and see the movie and i think it'll make its budget back and then some all right well as we were buying and selling up here at the table you guys were doing the same thing in the chat room and we move now to wendy the real wendy talking about what went down <laughs> what are the kids buying what are the kids selling well, they're selling the Batgirl movie. They're saying that they would rather see a Birds of Prey movie before they see a Batgirl movie. Mega Iron Man 98 says, so he's a talented director, but I don't see him directing a Batgirl movie, but it could be interesting. For Kellen Lutz says, He-Man, uh, they're also selling this, and they're saying that, Christian, you're spot on with what you were saying about this. The Power Tan says, I sell Kellen Lutz. His Hercules movie was terrible. He can't lead a movie. And finally, for the Morgan trailer, some are buying this, but a lot are selling it because they thought the trailer just showed too much. All right, very fair assessment as well from everybody out there in the world. Uh, before we go on to Mailbag, we want to remind you guys about this contest that's been ongoing for a few weeks now, and there's still a chance to enter, and that would be win a trip to Comic-Con. You and a friend will get airfare, hotel, and badges for Comic-Con this summer in San Diego, July 21st through the 24th, and we'll give you $250 cash in spending money. Use it however you see fit. It's open to residents of the continental United States, and again, we've been talking Talking about this thing for a few weeks so if you haven't entered it yet it's almost like you're ignoring me now and it hurts my feelings so go ahead and check out the link in this description click there and that'll have all the details or simply go to collider.com for your chance to enter Ashley you're already gonna be in San Diego hanging out with everybody the whole crew is gonna be down there it's gonna be a great time in the meantime how about some mailbags all right Rashad Hardrick writes hey collider crew my question refers to the divisive divisive response of Batman versus Superman ever since the movie was released in March people have been discussing slash debating the movie and the conversations are still going to this day with the release of the r-rated extended blu-ray being released soon fans are talking about b versus s even more the recent justice league set visit news has gotten people very intrigued and ben affleck has even confirmed that justice league will have a major presence at comic-con this year i believe that because of the divisive b versus s the release of the r-rated extended cut and the justice league news fans are more curious slash anxious about the dcu than ever which is great which is a great thing what are your thoughts do you feel that the response to b versus s has actually had an unusually positive effect i don't think it's had an unusually positive effect maybe that is the right way to describe some of the backlash to the backlash to the backlash then fans coming to defend against critics and all of that stuff i think the good news to come out of this the silver lining would be that they were influenced the filmmakers involved in justice league 
were a little influenced, maybe even a little hurt, by all the criticisms levied at Batman versus Superman, and that includes Zack Snyder. And I like that when you're taking all of that into consideration, it's not steering the ship, but it is nice to know that they factor some of those things going forward. They care about the fans to some degree and that their voice was heard. So if you are going to course correct Justice League ever so slightly, I think it's going to pay off down the road. I mean, one of the things that I said as I was walking out of Batman versus Superman, I was still scratching my head about how I felt about the movie, but I was universally excited to see the continuation of the DC Extended Universe. I was like, yeah, regardless of how I feel about that movie, I'm very excited to see Justice League, and I still am to this day. I'm not a, I'm not that high on seeing the R-rated extended cut of Batman versus Superman. I'll watch it. Maybe we do a commentary. I don't know. But I would like to see Justice League. I'm very excited about it. So I still think that a lot of people are jacked when this movie comes out to see more in the DCU. How do you feel, Christian? I think that there has been a lot of positive to come out of all of this because whether or not, I mean, just looking, glancing at the chat room and you still, you've got the hardcore fans of the movie as it was in the theater saying, it's great. Uh, you have the people who felt it wasn't, but there's this debate. And then there are the filmmakers and the producers who are listening and trying new things. Whether or not they said that Justice League was always supposed to be lighter, fine. But the conversations are there and they were listening. And it's very weird they were listening. And it's very, and we're, it's very, we're very aware that they were paying attention to the responses. And they, and anytime you make a movie, whether it's a comic book movie or just a movie in general, you want, as filmmakers, as artists, you want people to like what you're putting out there and you want it to universally, you want people to love what you're doing. So they're changing things up and they're switching up and they're getting the word out there and they want to show what they're doing. They're proud of Justice League and they're proud of the stuff. They invited all this. Um, they would have never done no. what they did with the set visit, allowing all the word to get out early, allowing people to start talking about what's happening in the Justice League had some of this backlash not happened. So I think it's a positive thing for us as fans to know the Justice League, what they're working on. Now we know that they're having a big panel at Comic-Con. Um, we had kind of assumed it, but now we know that Ben Affleck says it. So they're gonna really, I think it is positive for fans that they're gonna get a lot of information, but this is their version of the Avengers. This is the, all, the, all the heroes of the DC Universe coming together, we get as a fan, so yeah, I think it's positive. They showed scenes to select members of the press on during that set visit, so you gotta think, Dennis, when Ben Affleck says they're gonna have a big presence at Comic-Con, maybe us fans get to see some of that footage as well. Well, hopefully, and I think that's gonna be when we can make the ultimate decision. Well, maybe that, and then when we actually see the movie, if this was a positive thing, because at least in my opinion, the, the problems I had with Batman v Superman weren't tone. I didn't mind the dark tone. I just, there were for more, it was more about pacing and, and execution, and stuff. just execution of the story. And so the change now to a lighter tone doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be a better movie or they're gonna fix the problems. Maybe, we'll, we'll, we'll see, but I just, I don't know if, if that change that they're the reactionary change that WB is having with this, whether it's going to be a good thing or a bad thing. All right. Well, we have one more mailbag question. Then we're going to do one Twitter question. You get one Twitter question because we're running short on time. So tweet us right now at Collider Video. Ashley's going to pick one. Very good Twitter question. Ooh, but before we get to that, let's have one more mailbag. All right. Robert Johnson writes, I went to see Central Intelligence, PG-13, and the Sausage Party trailer played. There were children in the audience that screamed in terror during the kitchen scene. <laughs> yes. Do you think there will be any parents who see the poster alone and take their kids to see Sausage Party? Could that be a problem? Uh, it's going to be a fantastic fantastic problem and if you didn't want to have that talk with little Johnny or little Sally maybe you will after you take your kids to see this movie as a parent know what you're getting into a little bit okay yes it's a cute looking sausage on the poster but if you stare at it for a couple seconds you're gonna say oh that's they want that to look like something else maybe something that I shouldn't take my kids to see until they're of age so I'm not saying you're a total idiot if you're a parent you get fooled by this trailer but come on, man. Use some common sense. Don't just see it's animated and be like, oh, yeah, that's good for my kid. And if you do, let me talk to your kid afterwards because I would love to hear their thoughts on Sausage Party. I think this is hilarious. Uh, it'd be hysterical if that happened. And, I, and you know that someone's going to complain about it and someone's going to sue because, oh, I didn't know my kids. Uh, they didn't know. And now they're cursing. They can't get them to stop cursing. Um, you know, it's going to happen. They're going to someone's going to sue. But it's you're right. It's so ridiculous. It's like, first of all, when you're buying the tickets, look at your ticket where it's it says rated 
R. The trailers, even the PG-13, this is not for kids. We see that it's not for kids. The trailers don't try to pretend that it is for kids. Even the PG-13 version. So it is absolutely going to happen. There will be a report of someone taking their kids by accident and suing the filmmakers. You can guarantee it. But it, like you said, it's shame on you. Look at, Pay attention to what's happening in your life. I cannot wait for that hard-hitting day on Good Morning America when they talk to all those parents so who were jilted by, by Sausage Party. What do you got? Dennis. Yeah, it's totally going to happen. We mentioned that when we saw the the red band trailer, and then when they had the, the green band one, we're like, they're going to play this, and kids are going to go, oh, I want to see that movie, and you know. And then on the other side of that, it's going to be a small group, but I I could see some parents are going to bring their kids to see on purpose. I, I mean, I, I went to see Neighbors, the first Neighbors, and I saw parents bringing some of their like a five year old kid watching that. Yeah, five year old kid shouldn't be watching Neighbors, so. I see some parents actually bringing them to Sausage Party knowing what it is. Christian, you uh, know a lot about movies and you also have a daughter yourself. So what is the proper age for kids to be able to go see Sausage, sausage Party? Sausage Party? Yeah. 18. Rated R is 18. I and mean, that's that's what it says. Like, could 15, 16 year olds watch it? And will a lot of people and will 14 year olds probably check it out? What I have as a kid? Yes, but you're asking me the appropriate age. We're going by the rules and we're saying you got to buy a ticket. You got to be 17 or 18 to buy the ticket. And that's when you should be able to see it. But you're st I still think it could be appropriate for if a 13 or 14 year old wind up seeing it. But a 10, 11 year old, no, they shouldn't be seeing Sausage Party. You heard it here first. Take your eight year old to go see Sausage Party. <laughs> they are going to yeah. love it. Okay, gang, we promised you one Twitter question. This just happened. What do we got, Ash? Alan Reed writes What actor or actress has made you believe that they can be their character in real life? Daniel oh, Day Lewis. Man, that's Daniel Day Lewis is a great one because I actually thought they resurrected Abraham Lincoln. So yeah. Daniel Day Lewis is Christian with the opening salvo, Dennis. I mean, look. Sometimes you see somebody play a character, and maybe it's not too far away from who that actor is in real life. I get that vibe a lot when I watch Bill Murray. When I see Bill Murray in some of his classic movies like Ghostbusters or Stripes, I'm like, that's how Bill Murray would be acting. In the, if Bill Murray had to be in the army, or Bill Murray was looking for ghosts. There's one scene in Ghostbusters at the beginning when they're walking down the steps in that famous library, and all the other Ghostbusters are nervous. They don't know what they're about to see, and Bill Murray just has this look on his face like, what? This, this means nothing to me. That is who I believe Bill Murray is. I want Bill Murray to be that, and that's definitely who Dr. Peter Vankman is. So he says Dan Day Lewis. I got Bill Murray. Who do you got, Dennis? Uh, I was actually looking at the chat about uh, people were asking if we're going to do a Batman v Superman Ultimate Edition commentary. I believe Ben Affleck is Batman in real and, life. Yeah, and we will be doing that as well. I think actually me, Frosty, and Schnepp are going to watch the movie tonight. Oh, you the the Yeah, Boom. and then we'll probably do like a review, maybe a spoilers review of it. So I missed the question as I was trying to answer that. That's uh, okay. Dennis what, what was the question? That Kellen Lutz is exactly like he man right. and that he should be cast in the new Masters of the Universe. They asked why Ashley doesn't go to parties and if oh, she's going to be at the San Diego my. party. Well, the San Diego one she'll show up because it won't be like a like a, a 40th. So she I won't just be want this. you guys. Oh, okay. I want to know: Are you guys going to give the other two the same ass that you're giving? Oh, yeah. You're a liar. I have. I'm telling you for uh, the Schmodown stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, Thursday, Friday, I'll watch the show. Last I hope match, you guys, they get it. We had 40 people that matching. Not oh one my host. gosh, I not live far, host. guys. I live far. Look, it's gonna be me versus JTE. JT is very nice. He doesn't bite unless he's you know a t you know, prodded. So I feel just like he bites. I've seen him. Stay away oh. from. He might he might bite me when I beat the crap out of him at the Schmodown. But yeah. just have fun. It's gonna be a great time on Friday. And yes, we will all be hanging out at Comic Con. We'll make sure Ashley has no dinner all. plans oh. if you want to go meet her. <laughs> With all that. That being said, I want to thank everybody here, both behind the camera and up on the panel with me today on Movie Talk. Dennis, where can everybody find you? Well, you guys can actually find me on the Game of Thrones review that we did last night for the final episode of season six, which was amazing. The last two episodes of Game of Thrones have been, been crazy. You can find that on the Collider Video YouTube channel. You also can find me on Twitter at ThinkHero and Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. Shame, shame, shame. Yeah. Christian, yeah. where can they find you? Well, before I do that, also speaking on Game of Thrones, Dennis and I were kind of, we've been talking about, and they talked about it on the show last night. We are considering doing reviews of Game of Thrones season one up through season five, episode by episode. We want to know what you guys think about that. Ooh. So go to actually the video of last night's finale, or even here in, in the comments for Movie Talk. And if you want us to, the whole crew, the, the Game of Thrones crew, 
every week it'll be episode one season one and so on and so on leading up to what they did for the entire season six for me christian harloff twitter and instagram every thursday on jedi council um yeah and then the schmodown big match you got this guy baby carrots going up against <laughs> little evil jte go check it out it's gonna be a big one wendy lee where can everybody find you oh you yeah. can find me on twitter instagram and snapchat at wendy lee zaney and she frequently has dinner plans. That doesn't mean you can't find her online. Ashley Mova, where can the kids find you? On Twitter and on Instagram, at Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. I am simply at Mark Ellis Live, and I want to give a big shout-out to AMC Theaters, amctheaters.com. That's where you go for all the latest box office and showtime information. You can also go to Collider.com for all your breaking movie news story. That's where we get a lot of our stories that we bring to you guys each and every weekday. And, of course, subscribe right here, Collider Video on YouTube. Thanks to the panel. My name's Mark. See you guys next time. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.